Yeah, hello everybody um, to our course Macroeconomics. The reason why I'm late is just this one here that yesterday we had the handover of um, the annual report of the Council of Economic Advisors in Germany in Berlin. Very turbulent times because, well, the government crashed and um, maybe you clicked into the press conference. I think I sent you the, um, the link that also this committee is right now, yeah, uh, uh, also let's, uh, let's say, um, they do not have um, a common opinion. <laughs> they are very diverse in their looking at the economy. And um, yeah, it will be therefore also quite interesting how this gremium, <laughs> this committee develops in the future. Nonetheless, um, to have a look into this annual report is of course a good choice because um, it is an overall description of the state of the economy uh, today in Germany and there you find all also all the parameters we have discussed and of course uh, in much more detail than I have done it and also what I want uh, to mention is that I um, it is I can say something like a tradition here that every year I ask somebody of the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors to present um, the annual report and this will be then on Tuesday 26. This is in yeah, 12 days and Christopher Zuber <laughs> He is especially um, <clears throat> the guy um, looking, especially you see it here at the productivity. So what we have talked about, about potential output, um, medium long-term growth and so on. And he will then present um, the uh, annual report at our university. Um, yeah, and then I took the night train back and <laughs> the train crashed twice <laughs> at three and four o'clock and therefore <laughs> I was late today. So sorry for this, but uh, then we can start with our lecture. Well, we were at the point of um, monetary policy especially of the European Central Bank with the central aim of 2% inflation rate in the medium term. And then we discussed different instruments the central bank is using. And yeah, the main one is the main refinancing operations. And these are this is giving out um, central bank money to the private banks and they are handed out with the so-called key interest rate. And you hear this term and then we talked also about how this interest rate is feeding through the um, economy and especially this is a short term interest rate and there is of course not only one interest rate in um, the economy but we have different interest rates um, dependent on the maturity of our bonds and that this curve we call the yield curve and there we stopped our last um, in the last lecture that this yield curve is very interesting because we can use this yield curve 
so to speak, as an um, economic indicator and especially as an crisis indicator because from this market expectation theory we can derive a very nice dependence of and this is this part here the interest rates which we have today long term 4% and 2% 2 per, uh, 2 short term and the short-term expected interest rates. And from this dependence, we see it depends if this, um, that these uh, short-term expected interest rates are lower than the actual short-term interest rates if this bracket is negative and it is higher if this bracket as it is in our example, if it is positive. So short-term interest rate today is 2%. And from this equation with 4 and 2, we obtain that short-term expected interest rates would be 6%, uh, so higher than the actual short-term interest rate. And in the other way around, if we would interchange, if the situation would be uh, that um, the short-term interest rate would be 4 and the long-term would be 2. Then, of course, we would have here 2 plus, brackets open, 2 minus 4. This is negative, minus 2. So 2 minus 2 would be then that the market is expecting 0% um, <clears throat> for the short-term expected interest rate. And especially in such a case, when the market is expecting a decrease of short-term interest rate in the future, then we can ask ourselves, when does this happen? What kind of situation do we have? Well, we have talked about this, that the central bank is steering or tries to steer the short-term interest rates. So. In such a case, expecting falling short-term interest rates means also that we expect or that we are in a situation where the central bank is starting to lower the interest rates. And when does the central bank is doing this? Well, it is doing this when the economy is in a downturn or in a crisis because then credits will become cheaper and I can hope that I push the economy via this decrease of short-term interest rates. And therefore, we can then overall derive that if short-term interest rates would be lower then long-term interest rates, that then <clears throat> there is a crisis at the horizon. Well, and then we can look in the historical data and actually we find that before every deep crisis in history, we have found the situation that short-term interest rates were larger than long-term interest rates and this also I put down here the dependence of short-term expected interest rates equals long-term interest rates plus the difference between long-term and short-term rates okay and such a situation as I mentioned it if short-term interest rates are larger than long-term interest rates this we call an inverse yield curve because this situation if long-term interest rates would be larger than short-term interest rates so i1 i2 let's say one year 
two years. This we call a normal yield curve. And why do we say that um, this is the standard, this is the normal case? This is due to another explanation that short-term and long-term interest rates fall apart, part, and this is the so-called liquidity premium theory. And within the liquidity premium theory, we abandon from our assumption in the market expectation theory that the investors, the economic agents are risk neutral. Now we assume that investors are in general risk averse. Well, and this is actually just a empirical fact that in general or on average we find that people we the investors in general are risk averse so this is also not um, a law or something like this this is just an empirical fact that if we go down if we go downtown and if we ask 10,000 um, uh, people that then on average we would get the, ask, the answer that we are risk averse. So, and what does this mean? This means that if I'm giving away my money as a creditor, then I want a premium for the case when I give, if I give away my money a very long time. And because why I charge um, the debtor a higher interest rate for a <coughs> longer credit compared to a shorter credit is that um, we make the, uh, the, the example, let's say I give a credit for one year compared to a credit of five years. <laughs> then within these five years, there could something happen to my debtor that he becomes um, unemployed, for example, and that therefore I have a higher probability that I don't get my money back. And the second point is, well, today, let's say, I say on my banking account, I have 10,000 euros and um, I don't need it today. So I can give this away as a credit to my neighbor, for example. But then, of course, in the future, if the maturity is uh, five years, within uh, two or three years, my plans can also change. That, for example, um, my car is driving very well today, and I assume that my car is also driving the next five years. <sighs> but then I have an accident in three years, and then I think, well, hmm, I need a new car, but then I don't have my 10,000 euros. And for this, that I'm not liquid anymore, if I give my money a long time away um, with a credit, this we call then the liquidity premium theory that I take a premium for giving away my money a long time. And this behavior which we also find in general in the market is then the reason that in most cases we <coughs> see that long-term interest rates are larger than short-term interest rates and therefore we call this a normal 
yield curve. And then uh, we have a third um, explanation that interest rates for different maturities are falling apart. And this is the so-called market segmentation theory. Oh, this is in German, sorry. Um, that I have just to translate. Well, let's use just artificial intelligence. The risk arises for an investor if the investment horizon does not coincide with the term of the security. Yeah, very good. Better than myself. <laughs> um, and uh, this market segmentation theory, there we think um, that the market for bonds is splitting because let's say you are in an investor and you have an investment horizon of let's say seven years but if you go to the market you find only bonds with an interest rate you are looking for with a maturity of, let's say, 10 years. Well, then you have a risk when you are buying this 10-year bonds with an investment horizon of seven years because you cannot hold the bond until the end, until the 10 years, you are selling the bond after seven years. But in seven years, you don't know what is the price of the bond because you don't hold it until the end. Then you get out your 100, which you have invested, plus uh, the coupon pay payments. But in seven years, maybe it's 101 or maybe it's only 95. And therefore, you have a price risk. In the other case, let's again say investment horizon, seven years, and the bonds you are finding have only a maturity of five years. Well, then you have an income risk. Why do you have an income risk? Well, you are buying this five-year bonds. Then you get your money back after five years plus five-year coupon payment. And then you are reinvesting your money in a new bond until the full seven years. But then you don't know what you are earning overall. Because for the left two years, where you haven't found a bond today, you don't know what you get in the future. And therefore you have an income risk. And for this, we... Um, Assume then that, so to speak, the market is splitting in different segments, let's say in short-term bonds, medium-term bonds, and long-term bonds. So, for example, in three different 
segments of short term, medium term, and long term. And for all this, for the short term, for the medium term, with same interest rate Let's say I1, I2, I3, but all these are different. Well, to sum this up, uh, as I mentioned, this expectation theory, we find, we find that uh, before every deep crisis in history, we have this inversion, which could be explained by the expe expectation theory. So we find this theory really established in practical situations. Also, mainly we see this normal yield curve. So also we can say that we find <coughs> in practice this um, liquidity premium th theory to be valid, um, but the segmentation theory is hard to find in practical situations. So there, it is an explanation, but we cannot really verify it um, in practice. So this can hardly be verified in practice, while we find that the two other theories are more or less valid in practice. Okay, and um, here I show you some yield curves in history and more or less the actual history which um, we have right now. And what I have already told you is here in this part, in the actual situation, we have this inversion. So this is really a clear signal that something is wrong in Germany, in our economy. Today's inversion of the yield curve. Well, and then we have here the in uh, November 2000 and there you see a quite flat, normal but flat uh, yield curve and uh, the two others when you look at 15th of September 2008 here you have the inversion and uh, why do I have chosen this date? Mm. Do you have an idea? Mm. Yes, it is the year of the financial crisis and it is a very special day. Which event, uh, at which event more or less crystallized the financial crisis? In the internet, does anybody know it? So, 
So on 16th of September 2008, Lehman Brothers crashed. And Lehman Brothers is the fifth or was the fifth, sixth largest bank in the world. And well, just in this time, um, I was in the staff of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. And over summer time 2008, we uh, have started um, to count the defaults um, within the portfolios, but within the balance sheet of uh, the banks that um, uh, that we really saw, well, there is a problem in the banking sector. And in parallel, the oil price in summer 2008 really went up to its highest point at 150 US dollars per barrel. So inflation really went up. So then there was in summer 2008, uh, the discussion, well, inflation is more or less exploding and high inflation rates are in general a signal that you have a very high demand. Demand shift curve is shifting outward. So therefore it was the interpretation well, there is some problem in the U.S. housing market. Yeah, yes, we see also a problem in the financial sector, in the banking sector. But this has no impact on the real economy. <laughs> and then when this one of the largest banks in the world crashed. So in the end, an investment at Lehman Brothers, um, you got back from $1.08. So almost a loss of 100%. So this then initiated the start of the deep crisis and in directly um, two weeks later, all large central banks in the world simultaneously cut their interest rates. And this was then, so to speak, the starting point of going down to zero um, key interest rates um, in the world. And well, if you would have had a look at the yield curve a day before, and of course, if you go then um, uh, in, the, in the end of August, you also see that it is already an inverse yield curve. So the market has given the clear signal, well, there will be happen something. There is something wrong. We expect that in the near time, central banks will cut their interest rates. And this they are doing if we have a downturn in the real economy. Well, and then of course we had this really deep deep crisis with an um, shrinking uh, economy of Germany of 5% in 2009. Well, and then I also brought you the yield curve of 6 of March 2020. And here, not very much, but we see a light inversion in oops and um, if we take the liquidity premium theory and the expectation theory together then we can also argue that a little part of the higher long-term interest rates is just due to uh, to the liquidity premium 
And um, so we could say that our equation, which we derived for the um, expectation theory, short-term expected interest rates is long-term interest rate, I2, but then we can say that within these I2, we find also a liquidity premium. And this we can take out and then we can say, well, if uh, long-term interest rates are maybe 3%, then we maybe can say that 0.5% of these 3% are just due to the liquidity premium theory. So when we are want to argue with uh, the expectation theory, then the relevant long-term uh, interest rate would be then I2 plus some liquidity premium. I2 plus LP minus I1. And from this, we can argue that also a flat yield curve can be interpreted as an inversion. So in this very light um, inversion here, maybe we can say it is a bit deeper because within these uh, longer term interest rate here, maybe uh, three years is also a liquidity premium of 0.5 um, percentage points. So we can then also say here we see also the inversion, 6th of March 2020. <laughs> because why I chose this date? Yes, so Corona starts in Europe. And maybe you remember in January, in February, we still smiled about what happened in Asia. We smiled about the tourists uh, uh, on the ships sitting there in quarantine, already wearing the masks. And uh, I also remember I was here in the lecture hall. Um, and uh, I think we had then the shutdown at 18th of March or something like that, the first one. So I had three weeks of lecture in summer term 2020. And I did a nice calculation because there the absolute number in the beginning of March of Corona patients in Germany was roughly 100. <laughs> and uh, then I did with the students together also a growth process. Maybe uh, you know this um, when you take a flower at a sea which is doubling every day. How long does it take? Well, <clears throat> that um, the sea is packed with flowers. And here I took um, the infection rate beginning at February until March, coming to a number of 100 <clears throat> patients in uh, Germany. And if this goes on, how long does it take that everybody is infected? And roughly the estimation was in October. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, so we more or less still smiled in this time. Well, there is something, but nothing happens in Europe. But what you see here, 
in the market that you already have here an inversion of the yield curve. So the market has already the signal there is something, <laughs> there will something happen. Well, and then what happens, we all know this. Okay, so that much for the yield curve. And I also recommend, where do I have it here? I, it is on German, but maybe you understand this. Where is it? Yield curve here. I made also a video for um, the yield curve. And if you are interested in the pandemics here, I also did two videos to the pandemics. Here I forecasted a little bit what happens. This was at Eastern, so in April 2020. Mm. Um, okay, so please in the future have a look on this yield curve. Well, for a really direct forecast, of course, it is hard, but qualitatively, you really can say, if you see the inversion, be careful in the future. <clears throat> okay, and uh, then a short overview. Now we are after Lehman Brothers, what happened? We had here the so-called um, classical monetary policy instruments, and then we really start to invent many other instruments. And uh, this at the Council of Economic Advisors in this time was also my task to count <laughs> everything, uh, every new idea of the central bank. And this uh, yeah, was really a very intense time because if we go through this year, dropping interest rates very fast, to 0%, and then we had a period of almost 10 years with 0% interest rates. Well, if I would have um, went, uh, uh, if I would have uh, uh, go, went to my um, PhD advisor in 2002, because I did my PhD in monetary policy, and um, present, would have presented him uh, the idea, well, let me analyze a situation of 10 year, zero key interest rate. Um, what does this mean for an economy? Then he would have <coughs> had smiled and say, well, it, it's an interesting idea, but it is not relevant. <laughs> 10 years later, we were in this situation. Well, um, what happened also? So we really dropped interest rates. And then I told you, by law, the private banks need central bank money. And in order to obtain this central bank money, before the financial crisis, there was an auction every week. So the central bank, they calculated more or less, well, we will give out, let's say 60 billion euros for this month. And then the private banks had to apply. Well, I want 2 billion and I'm bidding 2% um, interest rate. Another one, 2.5 billion, 2.2% interest rate. And then the uh, central bank went through all this bidding, added every bit up until their 60 uh, uh, billion euros, which they wanted to hand out. And then it could be the case that a um, private bank, which has a bit um, a too low interest rate, didn't get the central bank money. So they then had to go to their neighbor private bank to ask for this money. But in the financial crisis, especially with the crash of Lehman, this was a very unsecure um, situation in the financial markets. 
and therefore the central bank changed this auction procedure to a so-called fixed rate tender with full allotment and this more or less means that a central bank gets now as much money as they want for the key interest rate though there is no auction anymore and also if they want to have a credit they have also <coughs> to um, give to the central bank some securities and these securities this had uh, um, have to have uh, a special rating triple a double a or something like this until the financial crisis but then within the financial crisis the private bank they uh, had not any more as much triple a double um, a securities and therefore the central bank downgraded the rating requirements and all this double B, single B is still in the balance sheet of our central banks. This is still a high risk which we have there. Also, the main refinancing operation lasts only one year, one week in this very turbulent times. This was also too short. Therefore, was an the introduction of longer term operations that the private banks got the money not only for one week but for one month three months until one year and even until three years of course the anchor currency in the world is us dollar and therefore was um, a direct uh, format between the ecb and the fed that also european banks could directly get us dollar and uh, I mentioned it in 2011-2012 in the aftermath of the financial crisis, especially uh, the financial market in Italy had also a very, very high risk. And therefore, the European Central Bank gave out three years tenders of 500 billion euros and compare this with GDP of Germany. GDP of Germany is 4 trillion. <laughs> so this is 20% of GDP of Germany. So a really, really high number. And this was especially for the Italian and Spanish banking sector. Then also, and discussing the money market multiplier, of course, dropping the minimum reserve requirement from 2 to 1% means increasing the money market multiplier from 50 to 100. You remember money market multiplier is 1 over the reserve rate. So if it's 2%, 1 over 2% is 50 and 1 over 1% 1 is 100. So increase from 50 to 100. And then also due to the it Italian situation, we have this what we call a Draghi put. <laughs> Um, have you already talked about financial derivatives, put options, call options, and something like this? <laughs> so a put option in financial markets is just the right, you are buying the right today to sell a security tomorrow for a fixed price. <laughs> And what Mario Draghi, president 
of the ECB announced at a conference in London in summer 2012. After that, there was just a press conference and then one journal journalist asked, um, here in the Italian financial market, uh, there is some uh, thing, ha there's something happen. Um, what will be, uh, what will the ECB are doing? And then Mario Draghi made this statement and here you can see also the video with the link. This is very famous. He said a quotation within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. So to help the Italian economy. And believe me, it will be enough. So what is this? This is a promise. If government bonds of Italy going up and up and up, and this was the situation, um, we had this in general very, very low interest rates in Europe. So in Germany, 1% or something like this. And compared to this, we had uh, interest rates of the government bonds of Italy of 5, 10%. So a very high risk for the government in Italy, because if they have to pay a very high interest, then they have a, a problem with um, <coughs> the public uh, to, to finance uh, the public expenditure, because they have very, uh, uh, they have to pay this high amount of interest. So this was more or less a promise for the market. Well, if you are still betting that Italy is crashing, then we will go into the private market and we will start to buy Italian government bonds in order to bring the Italian interest rates down. Well, and after this statement, after this speech, what happened? Without buying Italian government bonds, the interest rates of Italian government bonds went down. And because why? Well, if I'm still betting that they are increasing and believing the announcement of the European Central Bank, then I would lose money. So the market then more or less believed that in case uh, the ECB would start to buy specifically Italian government bonds. So only the announcement had the reaction that in the um, financial market the uh, Italian interest rates came down. Well, but uh, I think we have to admit this could function one time, maybe two times, but not always. Well, um, but nonetheless, in general, we had then the start of the so-called Euro crisis. And not in this specific amount, but in general, the European Central Bank started to buy government bonds. And then in 2015, they really started to continuously buy government bonds and, so to speak, every month roughly amount an amount. And this changed over the years between uh, 20 and 80 billion. So they started with 60 billion euros per month buying um, in general government bonds of the Eurozone. Well, uh, and then we wanted to stop this in the end of 2019. And unfortunately, what happened in the beginning of 2020, this was the pandemic and Within the pandemic, we even started an additional program to stabilize financial markets. And now here 
you see this very large number of 1.7 trillion euros. Well, and then we are going uh, further in history. The pandemic ended and what then happened, prices started to increase and since July um, 2022, we had this increase of interest rates and since six months, interest rates started to decrease again. So to speak, very interesting last 15 years in the financial markets and in monetary policy. So, um, and what we also see, uh, what is not only interesting, but what one has to know is, we talked very much about the key interest rate, the interest rate of the main refinancing operations, that this is the steering interest rate for the short-term market interest rates. But what we see here is the red line in Ionia ESTR. This is the interbank short-term interest rate. So this is the interest rate which the ECB wants to steer. And what we see is in the diagram, the black line is the key interest rate of the ECB. And what we see until financial crisis, we don't see the black line. Because why? Well, the ECB made a quite good job. The red line is just fluctuating around the key interest rate. And what then happened is that since then, we see the black line. And what we see now is that the short term red line market interest rate is now fluctuating around the interest rate of the deposit facility, the blue line. So since the financial crisis, the short term market interest rate is following the interest rate of the deposit facility. And well, what is the reason? The reason is more or less that where do we have it here? was this decision in the beginning of the financial crisis that there is no auction anymore. And because of this, we more or less, uh, or the markets now are oriented, not at the interest rate of the refinancing, main refinancing operations, but on the deposit facility, because why? The deposit facility is something like an endurance in our system. I can always put my money in case for the interest rate of the deposit facility to the central bank. And because I'm getting as much central bank money as I want, because of this, I'm now, I'm now orienting at this endurance, so to speak, interest rate. So... The reason is that there 
is no auction for central bank money anymore. Yeah, and in order to come to an end, uh, let's see also at some other measures. This is uh, the overall sum of the financial market interventions of the ECB. So all this buying um, government bonds, um, these PSPP, this is uh, the pandemic purchase program and the other ones are the programs with in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And what you see here is that all this is roughly three trillion euro. So the ECB is buying private securities, especially government bonds, for 3 trillion euros. And um, what can we say to this, what we now find in the balance sheet of the central bank? Well, the ECB is the institution which can, so to speak, fiat money invent money. They can print money. And what are they doing with this money? They are buying the bonds of the government in the European Monetary Union. And what did we have? We have roughly this we estimated GDP of the EMU was roughly 15 trillion euros. So the ECB therefore holds roughly 3 over 15 is 20% of the public debt of the EMU. Well, the ECB is an institution of the European Monetary Union. So to speak, we are holding our own debt. In quotation marks, we are holding our own debt. And this um, I call maybe, you know, this fairy tale Baron von Münchhausen. Well, there is a fairy tale that he fell in a swamp and how did he came out of the swamp? He took his own hand, took it himself at his hair. I don't have any hair anymore. I can do it, but he has, he has had long hair and he took himself out of the swamp, pushing himself at his own hand. And therefore I say, this is some kind of Münchhausen financing, because we give to ourselves the credit. We give to ourselves a credit. And this, of course, is still a risk if you see here that it is 20% of GDP of the European Monetary Union. Well, it comes down, but when we are now 
really not only in Germany, but in Europe, see also the risk of the new president of the United States increasing um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the tolls and um, that this would not mean that this amount really will drop in the near future. And therefore, I think that this is still a very high risk, which we have in the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. Well, and here we see the overall balance sheet. And there we discussed that the balance sheet is more or less something like the monetary base within our economy. And here you see we come roughly before the financial crisis with a balance sheet of 1 trillion or 2 trillion. And here at the highest point in the Corona crisis, we have a four, five, six times higher balance sheet compared to the situation before the crisis. So this is a large increase of money. Well, and since we had this large increase of money, then again, you can take quantity theory of money, that this will have the effect of inflation. Well, and therefore, um, also when the inflation started to increase in um, summer 2021, and this was half a year before the invasion of Russia in the, into the Ukraine. There, the ECB really said, uh, well, this is something that the people coming from Corona now restarted a little bit to consume. And therefore, we have this, so to speak, little increase of prices. Well, my interpretation in this time was really that this risk from quantity theory of money and this large increase of the monetary base, that there we had really the power to just push inflation and that we, in summer 2021, um, when more or less Corona ended, that uh, there we really had this effect from the quantity theory of money that we have not only a short increase of prices, but a longer increase of prices. And then additionally, we had the horrible invasion um, in the Ukraine. Yeah, and then I want to show you the last picture. And this is maybe my favorite one. These are the interest rates of 10-year maturity government bonds in Europe. And if you are talking about what is the interest rate level within a country, then you, may, you mean mainly the interest rate of government, a 10-year government bond. So this represents the interest rate level of a country. So if you somewhere have to have to do a market um, analysis of a country, then it would be looking at inflation, looking at uh, economic growth, looking at unemployment, and also just have a look at the development of the 10-year government bond. This is also one of the key macroeconomic parameters of a country. Well, what we see here is that coming from the 1990s, the interest rates of the European countries fell apart. 
very different interest rates in Europe. Well, and what happened then? This difference shrinks during time until roughly 1999. And then we had until the financial crisis from roughly 1999 until the financial crisis, EMU, European Monetary Union countries, had more or less the same interest rate. Well, and now I ask you, what this did this meant in these times? What started in 1999? This hopefully you have learned in school when you discussed politics or something like this. Yeah. Uh, this was a bit, little bit later than in 2000-2001. There was also a crisis, but for Europe especially, 1999, what started? Well, this was the introduction of the Euro. Yes, launch of Euro. Well, and starting the Euro, we had uh, this Maastricht Treaty. And within this Maastricht Treaty, we uh, had the so-called debt clause that the EMU member countries are not allowed to help each other when there is a problem of the financing <coughs> the public expenditure. So every EMU country should look at their own debt. This was introducing the euro. We had the so called no bailout clause. So, by law, it was forbidden to take the debt of another country. But what we see is that every country in the EMU had the same interest rate of government bonds. But what is the interest rate of a government bond? The interest rate of a government bond is just the signal or the price. How risky is my investment in this country? If I think that an investment in Portugal is more riskful than an investment in German government bonds, then I would charge the Portuguese government a higher interest rate. So, having these same interest rates since the introduction of the euro, what does it mean? 
market valued every member of the EMU with the same risk, same interest rates. Well, during this time, was there the situation that all countries had the same risk? So all countries had more or less the same economic performance? Of course not. They differed in the development. But still we have the same interest rate. So what does this then mean? If their market is valuing it as the same risk, although there are different risks, well, this just then meant that the market didn't believe the Nobel out clause. They just said, well, if there is a default of Portugal, then Germany and France will step by and help them, although it is forbidden. So market didn't believe the no bailout clause. Well, so it is more or less, again, a bet within the financial markets. Are here the financial markets, the investors are right that they, well, this was written down in the Maastricht Treaty and they just said, well, it is paper. But I don't believe you that in case this law will not hold. Well, and what then happened? Financial crisis, especially the default of Greece, the very high and large problems in Southern Europe and also in Ireland. And that, what did we do? We stepped by and helped all the other countries. And then in the financial crisis, we helped each other so this no belief in the no bailout clause market expectations were right. So and there you see really uh, how powerful are financial markets. And um, yeah, because of this little history I could tell you is uh, this my more or less favorite diagram. Here we more or less can take all what we have learned right now about economic um, performance, interest rates and uh, monetary policy and so on. And expectations, as especially expectations, are very, very important in interpreting um, economic data. And uh, that, yeah, you should be really careful when you think that you can bet against the financial markets. Okay. Then that's all for this. And then now we are more or less um, at the end of the, so to speak, first part uh, of the um, lecture of the general description, what kind of parameters do we have and the general functionality in our economy and Next week, then we start with the theory and we start then with the Keynesian economics and walking through and then we end with a neoclassical view. Okay, thank you very much and hopefully then at 8.15, <laughs> see you on Tuesday.